You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. The regular season is heating up. New stars are emerging, and that means more opportunities to win up to 25 times your cash on prize picks. The most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projection on a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's that easy. Let it fly to turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what make Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Watch your favorite players and get paid doing it this basketball season. See your entries make progress during the game or make new entries for the second half and the fourth quarter. Three pointers, assists, rebounds, and everything in between are yours for the taking. Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Picks app and use code GET100. That's code GET100 on Prize Picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Hi everybody and welcome to Who Did What Now, the history podcast that's not your history class. With me your host, Katie Charlwood, history harlot and reader of books. Disclaimer! The Who Did What Now podcast uses colourful language, swear words, cuss words and curse words. Now, if you do not feel that language is appropriate, you have my permission to piss right off. You don't have to listen to my podcast. You don't have to. This is the way I speak. This is the way I would chat to my friends. If you don't like that, you don't have to listen. See, here's what happened. I got an email from someone going, a request before reviewing. And they're probably going to like put me down to zero stars or something. Because um, they wanted me to drop the F-bomb less. Because they don't allow that word to float around their house. You know what? That's your prerogative. Don't listen to me. Just don't. Go away. Like, this is not something you are allowed to have input in. If I was using, you know, derogatory terms or um, ableist, bigoted language, then I could completely understand being critiqued. But you don't get to have a say in this. Like, I had someone say that, you know, they thought the fact that I used the word fuck and shagging on the, the Chanel episode, that it was highly inappropriate. And all I keep thinking is, this was a story about a fascist and a Nazi and a Nazi collaborator who got off scot-free, who had sex with high-ranking Nazi officials so that she could steal the livelihoods and or destroy and end the lives of her business partners and the takeaway from that whole thing was the wording the wording the fact that i used the words fuck well you know what if the words fuck and shit and bollocks and shag are a worse offense to you than blatant anti-semitism and fascism and the murder of innocent people, then I don't know what to tell you other than you clearly need to sort out your priorities. Because if curse words are worse to you than the murder of innocent people, there is something wrong with your brain. There is something wrong with you. Because on this podcast, I have described horrific details I have talked about murders, assaults, abuse. I have talked about the intimate details of a six-year-old's assault and murder. To the point where I cried and struggled to make the episode. But the word fuck is the issue? Like, you don't mind hearing those details, but the word fuck is offensive. Fuck the fuck off. No. It's actually really funny because um, I think I've told the crow story before because this is just shows you how I am as a person. 5am 
I'm bunking in my kids' room. I'm in the trundle in the kids' room because they're, they're struggling to sleep and they want me near them. And so I'm there and I hear this. And I'm like, what the fuck is this noise? It's a banging. It seems like someone's trying to break in the window. And like, and I'm like looking at the bathroom because that's where the noise is coming from. And there's a fucking crow. There's a crow banging on the window. And my mum's like, oh yeah, if you don't leave food out for the crow, then it will bang on the window at five o'clock every morning. Which is why we have to leave offerings for the crow every day. Every night, I should say. Because otherwise we're fucked, basically. So I go outside in my 5am exhausted state, swing open the door, point at this crow, which just stops and stares right at me. And I go, fucking no. Like, because that's how I speak. (laughs) In other news, I was sent, I don't even know if I mentioned this last week, I got sent the most amazing valentine's card it was like handmade and the worst part was i laughed at my own joke for a solid eight minutes because on the front of the card it said valentine you have great facts and even greater tits so it's my own joke and i found it hilarious and there's like a fan letter inside and there's these two little um they look like the cards you used to get in like the sweets that the candy cigarettes like it looks like those so one was like I think it's Big Bird, Sesame Street, Be My Valentine. And the other is Marie Curie. And it says, my heart radiates for you. And I, oh, it just sent me, I was crying. It was so fucking glorious. I love it so much. It's amazing. I love it so much. I'm actually going to frame it. And it's going to go up with my, like, collection of stuff. I have these, I have some things that I frame and I put up in my room. I've got the the Irish pride stamps. I got them up. I've got work from like Belfast based artists. I have a pirate stamp from when I completed this pirate escape room and it had like a wax seal, which is just the best thing ever. I have a um like a folio print of the, of the Tempest, which is one of my favorite um Shakespeare plays. And I have back when I had my comic book store I had these um, tickets made up for our very first cinema showing that I did for for like loyal customers. We used to do these special events. And I have my first ones that I had from that way back then. And um, I think I've got like a, a Captain Marvel thing and some like local artwork. And then that's just, it's just fun. So it's going to go up there with that. And then once I get like a proper like pod space, a pod loft or shed or whatever the hell it's going to be um i'm going to start putting stuff up in there because it's amazing i'm just i love it so much oh oh and and merch should be here by the end of the week now that i've got everything sorted so merch is officially finally coming oh they took me forever to do but i know what you're thinking you're thinking quit that jibber jabber in fact me in fact you i will but first, we've got to get our source on. Our sources are Trial by Impotence by Pierre Damont, Impotence Trials in Pre Revolutionary France by G. Gaines, Trial by Public Performance by R. Winters, Behind Closed Doors Impotence Trials and the Trans Historical Right to Marital Privacy by Stephanie B. Hoffman. Are you sitting comfortably? Good. Then let's begin. It is February, the month of love. And of course, because it is the month of romance, I was thinking what would be a good topic to discuss? Like, could I, I was trying to think of like really great love stories and the only one I could think of was Julie Daubigny, La Maupin. And I've already covered her on a a previous episode, so go listen to that. And then I thought, you know, every other sort of great love story I find is very patriarchal or ends with one or both dying in a horrific way. You know, there was no, like, nice one. And I was like, you know, 
let's just go the opposite route. Instead of talking about great love, let's talk about things falling apart. Because I can. Because it's my podcast and I'll do what I want to. Do what I want to. So, divorce. I mean, I am a child of divorce. So maybe, didn't that subconsciously push me to here? Huh. Whom's to say? Anyway, let's get divorced. But not now, because that's too easy. We sign some paperwork, we glare at each other across a courtroom, and we go our separate ways. Now, it sounds as if I've been divorced. I have not. I haven't even been married. I've never made it to that stage. I've been engaged. Too many times. And never really made it to the altar. Like, it, that never happened. Maybe that's why I eat so many lemons. Because I am so bitter. Getting divorced back in the day, pretty hard, pretty tough to do, excuse the pun, and especially the further back you go, when you get to like the late 1300s, early 1400s, all the way up until the 17th century, like, separating and marriages dissolving was really fucking hard to do. So it all comes back to the church are we surprised no because it's the olden times medieval times to be exact not the restaurant which i've never been to i'm not really keen on turkey legs but i still feel like i should go to one at some point for the lols so we're mainly going to focus like starting from the 1400s and we're going to be in both england and france Now, I've spoken about France and the impotence trials before on um, TikTok and Instagram because I'm obsessed with this idea. It's, it's, I can't help myself. It's just weird and creepy and I'm kind of into it. Like, not as a voyeur. To clarify, I find this little cultural bubble, this specific incident within this time frame to be fascinating. I'm not a creepy weirdo, I promise. I mean, I am a creepy weirdo, but not for that. For many other things. Awful, awful twisted things, but not that. So this whole situation starts because of church laws from the 13th century. So basically, English and French laws at the time were fairly similar. Probably because they had the same sort of rulers. So they all came under canon law. So, the rules of the Roman Catholic Church. It's all Catholicism. It's all their rules. Now, remember, this is the past. And this is based on 13th century Christian laws. Right? So, under these rules, marriage was seen as between a man and a woman and was monogamous. So, him, her, nobody else. Uh Uh-uh. Nothing. Just the two of them. Nobody else. So under this rule, cheating is a no-no. No extramarital affairs by either party. Uh-uh. So the second rule was that once a Christian marriage was like fully formed, it could not be dissolved if either of the parties were still alive. So basically, once the marriage was consummated, once they boinked, shagged, screwed, did the deed, knocked boots, and other such euphemisms, then it was a solid marriage and they had to wait for one of them to croak it before they could remarry. The third rule was that close relatives could not marry. So this could be like brother, sister, father, daughter, or even, depending on how it was seen, brother-in-law, sister-in-law. Kind of like, well, well Henry VIII uses this at some point. Because he basically says that because when he's trying to, like, get rid of Catherine of Aragon, right? He's trying to chuck Catalina. He's not happy. Once they're gone. So what he does is he tries to use this kind of logic, church logic, by saying that their marriage wasn't valid because she was his sister-in-law, his brother's widow. And as such, under the eyes of God, their marriage wasn't valid. However, they did get a papal dispensation 
which allowed them to marry, which sort of circumvented that rule. But yeah, I know, swings and roundabouts, isn't it? The fourth rule was that once a marriage was fully formed, again, consummated, that that marriage was now a sacrament of the church. So there's like, what, seven sacraments in total? I'm trying to remember now. Like a good... I went to Catholic school. Give me a minute. I also went to Sunday school. I used to collect those saints cards, like Pokemon cards. Why do you know so much about theology, Katie? Well, I'll give you three fucking guesses. The seven sacraments are baptism, or christening, communion, confirmation, marriage, last rites. There's going to be more. What I miss. There's the sacrament of penance, which is basically confession, contrition, satisfaction. So you do your penance, you do your five Hail Marys and an Our Father, congratulations. And then the other one I think is, I want to say holy orders. Anointing the sick, I think also comes under last rites, right? It's been a while, okay? It's been a while since I've had to do any Catholic stuff. Roman Catholic, the OG kind. Woo, woo, woo. It's always really funny though because like my dad's side are Jewish and my mum's side are like Roman Catholic so you get the Old Testament and the Old Testament with DLC. Downloadable content. And yeah so marriage is one of the, the sacraments and so this would be like the 1200s so we're talking Henry the Third, probably ish around about this era and he's part of the Plantagenet line so he's from Eleanor of Aquitaine right? who also had her marriage annulled, lest we forget, uh, because they got annulled because apparently the daughters, the two daughters she had with her husband, does not an actual marriage make. Even though she wanted to, like, get rid of him for years, it took him pushing it. But go listen to the episode, Eleanor's a badass, go listen to her. So by the time these 13th century rules come around, marriage is indissoluble. You cannot dissolve it. It's, it is what it is. You're stuck there, pal. Don't know what to tell you. Like, effectively, divorce isn't really a thing because France and England at this point are just super Catholic. And because of the way things worked, you basically ended up with two forms of divorce. The first of which was dissolving the marriage, annulment as if it never happened. Go live your lives, right? The second was more akin to, like, a separation. So they could separate, but they certainly couldn't remarry. Like, it just wasn't an option. Like, one of them had to die before the other could remarry. So, like, if you got divorced and you didn't get permission to remarry, and you then remarried, it would be seen as adultery. And, like, if you're a woman, you're going to get fucking stoned and shit. Well, maybe not stoned in medieval France. But, like, things wouldn't work out well for you, shall we say. And so, if you've got an abusive husband, or he's just, like, I don't know, really boring, or you're not happy with your wife, there's no way to, like, escape that other than, I don't know, a carefully coordinated murder that looks like an accident, maybe? Because it was really tough for divorce to happen. But then, of course, there's, you know, the trick up the sleeve which is the core, one of the core values, really, of Christian marriage, which is procreation. So especially in medieval France, like, sex during marriage wasn't just, like, approved. It was fucking mandatory. Excuse the pun. And, like, the long and short of it is, it was basically illegal not to have sex with your spouse in medieval France. So if you're married and your marriage does not produce children, it was basically seen like this act against God. Like you were doing something bad. It was a slight against the Almighty because you have not procreated. Which is a really shitty take regardless of the century you're in. So yeah, it's basically illegal not to have sex with your spouse and not to create children. So what would happen is women who were generally unhappy in a marriage for whatever reason, 
they would come forward and claim that their husband was impotent and their marriage wasn't consummated and ergo an annulment was necessary. And they would go forward to these ecclesiastic courts, right? And these ecclesiastic courts would determine whether or not the man was impotent. So they had a couple of tests, right? Because they had to make sure not only that the husband could perform his husbandly duties, but also that the wife had not been, I don't want to say penetrated, but also penetrated. But I am getting ahead of myself. The couple have to go to this ecclesiastic court. So this court run by the church because it's canon law, not common law, right? So church law, which basically was the ruling shed at the time, you know. So there was four main things that happened at these trials. The first, obviously, paperwork. Got to have that red tape. So they would go through personal documents. So private letters, papers, prayer books with annotations on them. The whole shebang. They'd collect those and they would peruse them. And to look for evidence of non-consummation within the marriage. The couple would also be interrogated that's right they would actually take them into rooms like separately and fucking interrogate them to get the information they were looking for they didn't like torture them but this was like a professional interrogation like they had people whose specific job it was to like interrogate spouses canon law also meant there had to be like a decision maker so there had to be a judge So one person was making the decision. There wasn't a jury like a common law would have. It wasn't like a group of peers. It was one dude. And it was going to be a dude. And the last thing was like rules of evidence. Which we're going to get to. So after all this is sort of done, they've been interrogated. You know, the defendant, the husband, effectively, usually. It was rare to be the woman, but it's generally the man, is they would come into the court, they would have to say their piece, they would have to acknowledge, you know, their accusations, and they would have to testify against it. I'm just going to take a moment to apologise for my voice going, because it's it's not great right now. So basically, this libel case would be drawn up against the defendant, the husband, and it would have to, you know, accuse him of being, I don't know, frigid, for being physically incapable and, you know, a bunch of reasons. Like, they had to be married a certain amount of time to prove that a long enough period of time had, like, passed. You know, to show, like, we should have conceived by now or consummated or however they're playing it. And for the most part, like, the burden of proof fell on the husband to prove that he, you know, had a fully working penis, effectively. Being a part of a royal family might seem enticing, but more often than not, it comes at the expense of everything else, like your freedom, your privacy, and sometimes, even your head. Wondery's new podcast, Even the Royals, pulls back the curtain on royal families, past and present, from all over the world, to show you the darker side of what it means to be royalty. From icons like Grace Kelly, Oscar-winning actress turned Princess of Monaco, who the world saw as the ultimate good girl. She mastered playing a happy wife and mother, but beneath it all, she was desperately lonely. Grace spent her whole life working towards perfection, and it ultimately cost her her happiness. Or King Ludwig II from Bavaria. He was only 18 when his father died, leaving the crown to him and a duty to rule that he never wanted. He refused to lead and used the funds from the royal treasury to further his extreme love of opera, but this choice eventually cost him the crown and his life. Follow Even the Royals on the Wondery app or wherever you get your podcasts. You can binge Even the Royals ad-free right now on Wondery Plus. The regular season is heating up. New stars are emerging, and that means more opportunities to win up to 25 times your cash on prize picks, the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projection on a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's that easy. 
Let it fly to turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what make Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Watch your favorite players and get paid doing it this basketball season. See your entries make progress during the game or make new entries for the second half in the fourth quarter. Three pointers, assists, rebounds, and everything in between are yours for the taking. Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Picks app and use code GET100. That's code GET100 on Prize Picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less. It's that easy. So, many, many tests would be done. So, in England, they would bring in what they called honest women to check the penis to make sure that it was you know, working properly, could get an erection, so on and so forth. And they would report back to the court their findings. And in France, they would generally use sex workers for this. Now, I don't know if honest women is a, a phrase for sex workers specifically. If you are a medievalist, please let me know this, because I couldn't find it. I tried. Google did not work for me. And I don't really have that many medieval books, so if you know, I would like to be informed. In both courts, like once, you know, it was established that an erection could, you know, occur and then be maintained, the next step was ensuring it could function properly. So they would have to, in a cold, sterile um, courtroom, Surrounded by people, they would have to expel bodily fluids. They would have to masturbate while being watched and ensure ejaculation. Now, this may surprise you, gentle listeners, but unless you're into voyeurism, unless you like being watched, that level of pressure and that amount of people watching you Unless, unless you are very much into that sort of thing, chances are those husbands would be going, not coming. Not at all. Needless to say, during these impotence trials, the success rate was very, very low. Most males were not able to pass this test and ergo their marriages were annulled. Some would be done then and there but then others would have the opportunity to perform a trial by Congress, which is just as bad as you think it is. But for now, let's talk about the women. So just like pre-marriage, a lot of women, especially noble women, would have to have a gynecological exam to prove that they were pure. And, okay, this is really funny to me, um... Because medical science, although not perfect, has come a long way. Biology has, we have learned a few things. But back in the medieval times, there was this belief that if a woman's hymen was intact, she wouldn't be able to urinate. I I don't know where this came from, but it was a thing. So they would get checked and stuff and... Women were expected to hold in their pee. And if they didn't pee, they were virgins. Oh my goodness, I almost forgot about this. Okay, so one thing that would come up in these ecclesiastical courts was sexual positions. So according to the church, Roman Catholicism, all that jazz, the only appropriate sexual position for consummation in marriage was missionary style. Like, that was how you were supposed to do it. No other way. And so there was this assumption that if you were in any other position, that it would not create... There would be no conception, there would be no fetus, there would be no baby. Like, by putting a wife in a position that would not result in conception was very much seen as fraudulent, like, on the part of the husband. So... If he had put her in like doggy style or whatever, he was committing fraud because it wasn't going to result in a baby. Because again, the purpose of their marriage 
is to create more little Catholics. Like, that's the purpose. So both parties, when they were being interrogated, would have to intimately discuss their sexual possessions. And if they said anything other than missionary, they were deducting points. But yeah, if they weren't using the correct possessions, if she was able to hold in her pee, and or if he had a flippity floppity phallus, that marriage was dissolved and they could go on with their lives. However, there was another option. If a husband was deemed impotent by the impotence trials, or if he felt slighted enough, he could demand a trial by Congress, which is basically doing the do in front of a team of experts. Now, I say experts. The couple would be brought to a neutral location where they would have to perform their conjugal duties in front of a team of surgeons, midwives, and priests. Now, let's just think about that. Surgeons, fair enough. Midwives, I can get behind. Priests? Priests are the experts on this? Okay. So yeah, they're in this neutral territory. They've both agreed on it. They're there. They then get searched. Because men had been known to like sneak in tiny vials of blood and then attempt to hoodwink the court into thinking that they had taken their wife's maidenhead. Like enough people smuggled it in and were then caught that they had to just do this. So after getting there, being searched, stripped, the estranged couple were then expected to get on a bed and boink in front of these people. Now, as I said before, the married couple are estranged and as such, some of these trials by Congress could literally last hours. If you are a sexually active person, I'm just going to let you imagine just how uncomfortable that would be. Take a moment. It's okay. It's okay. So the men, the surgeons and the priests, they would like be behind this partition, sort of spying, and the midwives would be perched by the pillows. I could only imagine them like shouting, giving tips, tutting and muttering disapprovingly. And so like they're there so they don't miss any piece of the action. So after this goes on for however long it goes on, like they check, you know, the sheets to make sure there has been an appropriate expulsion of fluids. Uh Uh-huh. And if a man was deemed just, like, incapable at this point, like, either way, whether it was by the impotence trial itself or by the trial of Congress, he would be seen as, like, a laughing stock. He would be ridiculed. It would have been very much a thing. Now we're going to get into some particular cases. So in 1370 in England, there was a case between Tidia Lampard and John Sanderson. And three honest women have to physically examine John and return back to the court. And they say, and if you don't want to hear descriptions of penises, you might not want to listen to this. So basically it said that his penis was like an empty intestine of mottled skin and it does not have any flesh in it. It doesn't have veins and the middle of its front is totally black. I don't know about you, but this does not seem like a a typical description of a penis to me. I'm sorry, but this description is just like so much worse. Like that was read aloud in court afterwards. Like that's got to suck and blow. Jeez. Okay, so, you know, they attempt to get it up. So they're, you know, they're stroking it and they place it in semen. I'm sorry, but what the actual fuck? They thought that, like, how did they collect it? Oh my God, I'm just having, oh no, oh no, the Rainbow Bright video. Not Rainbow Bright, Rainbow Dash. Oh no, the My Little Pony. Nope, nope. 
Don't look it up if you don't know what it is. Don't look up the rainbow dash jar. You will be scarred for life. So apparently they have a bowl of sperm for dipping. I don't... What? What? What the actual... I'm sorry. They had a bowl of baby gravy for them to slap the schlong in. I just... I thought people were weird now. And I'm not here to yuck anybody's yum, but... Really? Really? A dick dish for dipping? What? Anyway. Back on point. Back on point. So basically, they tried playing with it. They tried dipping it in the semen saucer. And nothing happened. There was no movement. There was no excitement. There was no growth. It wasn't turgid or rigid. It was merely flaccid. And... This gets sent back to the court and they're like, yeah, no, um, clearly something's wrong here. There's clearly an issue. And as such, this marriage is annulled because clearly he cannot perform his conjugal duties. I actually really feel bad for, for him in this situation because that's not great. Like that's, everybody in town's going to know that now. That's, that's a wee shame. Oh, oh, and also his scrotum, I forgot this bit, his scrotum, the skin was there, but the actual, like, balls didn't seem to be there. So there was just, like, I don't know, like, you know when you peel the skin off, like, a KFC, and it's just kind of there? Like, I think that's what it's like. It's just kind of there, but nothing in it. Like a deflated balloon wrinklier so yeah they get this information that marriage is annulled so back in 1368 this woman Catherine Pennell she takes her husband Nicholas Cantaloupe to court to annul their marriage and so they call him in he's supposed to get his physical he doesn't show up like he gets the heck out of dodge in just scarpers like he disappears they can't find him. Like, like, I can only assume that he knew it wasn't going to go well for him. And so he just went into hiding. And, I mean, I can't really blame him for that. Because clearly, this is not something people want to go through. Because Catherine's testimony said that when she placed her hands, like, on where her husband's genitalia should be, there wasn't anything there. I think the term she used was it was as flat as the palm of a man's hand. I don't know. Are women's palms not also flat? I don't know. So there's a theory that Nicholas had congenital adrenal hyperplasia which is basically a condition like since birth that would create a situation where the penis would not fully form or grow. Uh, effectively the person would have a micro penis it's rare but it did occur now there is always the option that perhaps nicholas was intersex but was raised as a boy or perhaps nicholas was a trans man we're not sure like we don't have that evidence but it very well could be just floating the idea so those two cases were in england so now we're going to move on to france so in the 18th century, the Marquis de Gev was accused by his wife, um, the Mademoiselle de Mascrenet, that they'd be married for three years and that the Marquis, like, he would not do anything. He would basically lie beside her and do nothing else. And she would, like, try, but he just was not... He would reject her advances of, you know attempts at intimacy and copulation so she would you know try and arouse him and he just wasn't having any of it right the mercury he's brought in he is examined and they have to check his member so he has to go through many many observations and tests so they're doing all these tests they're checking the shape the color 
the number. They were checking how many were there as if they're, I don't know, examining Klingons? Like, are they expecting a double dick situation? Like, okay. He has to undergo all of these tests and all the evidence has to point to him being able to procreate. Like, he has to be able to create more little Catholics. So this ends up as a a win, kind of, but also not. So he's shown to be able to get an erection. Unfortunately for the Marquis, he is unable to maintain an erection. But they have issues more than just the maintaining they said that the tension, hardness, and the duration of which the erection lasted all pointed to him performing poorly. And the Marquis was about to be like ritually embarrassed and be divorced from his wife because the courts deemed him impotent. But luckily enough for him, his wife died suddenly. And so he has saved the embarrassment. I don't know how she dies. I'm hoping it was, you know, a medical thing or an accident of some kind. But, uh, whom's to say? No. There's a different story for, um, the Marquis de Lange. Lange? Marquis de Lange? Lange. Oh, I'm, it's it's late. Clearly, I'm not thinking properly. So, the Marquis de Langer, he is um, not as lucky as the Marquis de Gevre because it's, what, a century earlier, so the 17th century. And he's been married for four years and he's accused of being impotent. But unlike Gevre, He was not accused of, like, disinterest sexually. So, like, he had an interest, but he just wasn't capable. That's the accusation, right? So, the married couple are brought in, and they are both examined. So, they do all the tests, they check the colour, the rigidity, all that stuff. They try to make her pee, whatever. They bring in the ladies of the night to have some fun with him and both parties are deemed to be sexually healthy and that they should be able to procreate. They're basically saying his ghoulies are in tip-top shape and that the madame was not a virgin. Now the Marquis he's happy with this so far but the madame de Langer she's not so happy. In fact She's absolutely livid. She's standing up in court making this trial continue because she's saying he's a harsh lover, so he's rough, and the positions he's putting her in, they're not for procreation. Like, the sex they're having is for his gratification, his pleasure, and not for the manner of of what it's supposed to be as per canon law, which is making babies, right? And at this point, the church is very much on her side because their marriage, after however many years, still has not produced any children. And that's not looking good for him. But if he had just kept his trap shut, like, it could have proceeded and he may have been able to wiggle his way out of it. But his ego was bruised. And as such... He effectively goes, fuck this for a game of soldiers. I want a trial by Congress. He demands a trial by Congress. He demands it. He's like, no, I'm going to prove to you that all my bets work. He wanted, no, he needed to prove that he could in fact procreate, that he had the physical capability to do so. And then... When they actually get round to doing the deed, I mean, maybe it's um, because he was in front of five physicians, five surgeons, and five matrons. No priests in this one, thank Christ. 
But yeah, he's trying to perform sexually in front of 15 people, several of which are perched beside him on the pillows, watching his every move. He can feel their eyes on him. Needless to say, this does not end well. They attempt to do the deed. He does not ejaculate. And his reputation is in tatters. And in a move that surprises absolutely no one, his wife is granted a divorce. So for the Marquise de Langer, he's, you know, I mean, he's ridiculed. His reputation's not great. He has to return his wife's dowry. And to top it all off, he is forbidden to remarry. Because as far as they're concerned, like, if you cannot do the deed, you should not get married, right? But he does. He gets remarried anyway. And with his second wife, they end up having, was it seven kids in total? So things didn't work out the worst for him all in all. And like, it wasn't until, what was it, the late 17th century, early 18th century, that, you know, impotence trials and the trial by Congress really got phased out and disappeared. Like, it started fading in the late 17th and then by the 18th it was very sporadic, if at all. Because, you know, apparently shagging in front of a room of people was just becoming too much of a spectacle. And for France, the country is so open with its sexuality. But there you go. The impotence trials and trial by Congress where it was basically illegal not to shag your spouse. So, what did we learn today? Don't get married in medieval times, because that just seems unpleasant for everybody. Two, do not let your bruised ego and your inflated sense of self-importance put you in a situation where you should have to screw your wife in a room full of people, un- unless you're into that sort of thing and everybody consents, because... It's up to you. We don't we don't judge here, okay? As long as it's all consenting adults, you have a good time. And thirdly, charge laws are fucking weird, man. Fucking weird. Now, if you liked my telling of the impotence trials, which I'm very sorry I've been losing my voice this whole time, probably from the ranting, you can always go and rate and review five stars. Um, Apple Podcasts and on Spotify and wherever you listen to podcasts. Like on Apple, if you write a review, it doesn't matter what you say. As long as you give five stars, you can say anything. You could tell me your favourite Valentine's present you ever got. Or the funniest card you received. Or... Then Valentine's is just a Hallmark holiday. Oh, Valentine's is just one day. So is Christmas, bitch. So is your birthday. It's just one day. Why are you celebrating that? Just saying. Just putting it out there. If you like my content and want to support me more, you can always tip me on PayPal. There's a link in the description down below. Uh, you can get some merch, which will be available by the end of this week. Woo, 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 woo. And yeah, you can follow me on socials and interact with those. And I don't know, share this podcast with people and make them listen to me and rate me because they're awesome and I am awesome and we should all be awesome together don't you think yes now recommendation time so someone suggested that my recommendations that I do I should post them on Instagram because when they're driving and listening to the podcast they don't always catch what I'm I'm like sharing so that's fair and I'm gonna start doing that For reading, I'm going to recommend Unwell Women by Eleanor Cleghorn, which is all about the misunderstanding and misinterpretation of of women's illness throughout the whole time. For watching, you know what? I'm going to recommend The Last of Us. I am. It just uh, made me cry. So many human emotions. I can't. And also Pedro Pascal is amazing. Oh, love him so much. And for listening, I'm going to recommend the new Harley Quinn podcast that's come out. It's voiced by Christina Ricci. It is a retelling of of the story of Harley and how she became who she was. And it's from her perspective. 
And it shows that she wasn't just a pawn in this game. She was the one moving the pieces. So yeah, um, that is me. That is everything for today. And there's actually going to be a Betty sewed this week. First time in a wee while. I think you're going to like that. So if you've made it to the end of this podcast before I go, I just want to say thank you to everybody who listens. Everybody who has listened. Everybody who continues to... You like DM me on socials, like share my stuff. Everybody who's still here. Like, I really, really appreciate you. And I want you to know that I am very grateful that you tune in every week. That you download, that you listen, and that you like the stories I'm sharing. I'm sorry I've been losing my voice today and it's just been kind of affecting me as well, I think. All this is, cannot get a bit much sometimes, you know. But I I do want to say thank you and that you all mean so much to me because the fact that you're listening, the fact that you're here, you're just awesome. I love you, all of you. And with that, I shall bid you adieu. Adios, au revoir, au revoir, my friends. Bye-bye.